Are you ready to alter your life? Because that's what's about to happen. If you're looking for a judgment-free zone where TMI doesn't exist, to have the conversations you're not supposed to have, and explore how to make small yet substantial, sustainable changes in your life to actually care for and empower yourself through physical and emotional fitness, then you're in the right place. I'm your host, Alyssa Alter, M-O-M-D-O-N, the Amy Poehler of vaginas, author, speaker, coach, former Broadway performer, certified Pilates instructor, pelvic health expert, comedian, co-founder of postpartum.com, mom on the mend, and board certified doctor of nothing. I believe that if we put as much time, energy, and discipline on our insides as we do our outsides, we'll be unstoppable. I am so excited that you get to listen to today's episode. I am not kidding when I tell you that this episode has everything. We've got cults, which if you know me, you know I love cults. We've got cults. We've got sex. We've got puppets. We've got Pilates. And we've got my friend Kayla Prestel. She is the owner of Feel Good Pilates here in New York City where she teaches clients. She hosts teacher training programs and workshops. And she does, I'm saying this as someone who works out of her studio, she provides a supportive home here in the heart of New York City for fitness professionals. She's also worked for over a decade as a puppeteer and a stage actor. And Kayla is sharing her... I... I just so her evolution and transformation is stunning and inspiring and the way that she shares it with such honesty and presence and authenticity which I know are like buzzwords but I really mean them right now is absolutely inspiring. I am so proud to call her a friend. She and I met years ago while she talks about this in the episode. She and I rented studio space at the same studio, which then closed, and she opened up her own space. And, you know, it's it feels like it's not so much a coincidence and more besheret, which is like the Hebrew word for like meant to be and aligned, um, that... It was around the same time that the studio we were renting and that we were renting at closed. And so she was deciding to step out onto her own into her business as she was also evolving through and out of the internalized conditioning and sort of indoctrination of the church and what that meant in her body and moving through that and starting to really take ownership of her body and make decisions for herself. And what really, I mean, there are so many things in this episode that blew my mind, um, especially the Little Mermaid part, which you'll love. Um, Yes, I sing. I just, I don't want to leave that question hanging there in the air. I have been thinking about this a lot, right? This podcast is called Alter Your Life. And I believe that making these small yet substantial alterations in our life can yield huge impactful change. And I believe that the first step in altering your life is connecting to, learning about, and taking ownership of your vagina of your pelvic floor, of the female anatomy, anatomy, which we are taught to be ashamed of, keep hidden, and keep secret. And I really believe that this is our first step in breaking generational, inherited, patriarchal, all bullshit that we have embodied in our body that keeps us small and keeps us from moving forward. So, okay, I'm fired up. Enjoy the show. And I cannot wait to hear what you think. One more thing before we hop into the episode. Today's episode is brought to you in partnership with a company that I have been obsessed with for years. Oh, nut. Okay, maybe you don't know what this is. Maybe you do. O-Nut is a silicone 
silicon, silicone, silicon, donut shaped device that you can stack together that you place on your partner's penis or a dildo or um, you could even use this with a dilator if you're working with a dilator with your physical therapist for vaginismus or anything else going or um, post-surgery where the O-nut creates a buffer, okay? So if you are experiencing painful sex or like say you recently had a baby or a surgery downstairs and you want to be physically intimate with your partner, you want to start exploring penetration and you are scared. And as much as your partner or yourself with um, a toy of your choosing are nervous about penetrating too deeply, this is like a bumper and you can remove the pieces or add the pieces for how much of a bumper that you need so that even if your partner gets excited or you get excited, you know it's not going to go further inside than you've already predetermined, which allows you to feel safe. There's no risk of an I am maybe speaking from personal experience um, of your partner getting really excited and like jamming it in real deep, which can feel awesome and be an exciting surprise. It could also just be a surprise you're not ready for. So the O-nut is the solution. It also lets you start to wrap your head around what it would feel like to receive penetration again and or give to your partner in a way that you know that you're safe. You know where the boundaries are and you can, instead of focusing on that, focus on the sensation on the experience, on everything else that's going on during sex. So I have recommended Onut to clients for years and everybody loves it. And I'm really excited because I have a code. Um, it's my name, Alyssa7, to save $7 on any order. And at the very least, Go check them out. Follow them on Instagram. Support this amazing company and business, which was founded out of need and is founded by and run by women and for women. And with that, let's get on with the show. I mean, I it was just yesterday walking to the studio from the subway and, um, you know, I've been it just kind of hit me as I'm thinking about now it's like these decisions that I'm making are in regards to the next lease renewal. And two years ago, if you had asked me if I would even think about renewing the lease, I was trying to get out of the lease, you know, in my head, I was thinking about potentially that being an option. I mean, we were in the middle of a global pandemic in New York city and I was not legally able to operate my brick and mortar business for six months, you know, after just signing the lease, six months prior. And uh. now I here I am three years into the lease. And actually it feels like finally the business is at a place where it kind of can stand on its own. I always, I, I've never had children, but I always kind of feel like the, the path has been very parallel to having a baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so, you know, those nine months, it took about nine months to, to sign the lease and get it going and open it, you know, and that was like the pregnancy. And yeah. then it was finally birthed. And for like three to six months, I could not leave it. You know, I feel like I, I could not leave the city without having a panic attack. <laughs> I was like, I can't leave the city. <laughs> and I would like every day I would like look at this. I'm like, is everything okay? Like even just leaving at night to come back the next day was scary. Um, until, you know, it finally got to the point where I could leave for a couple of weeks. And like I set up, you know, I set up people to keep an eye on it, <laughs> like sitters. Yes. And now it's like, it's like three m months later. Oh, and then I got to the, like the terrible twos, you know, where I was just fed up with it. I'm like, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> like, this is terrible. I this hate the studio. This is not what anyone said it would be like. This is not, <laughs> nobody said that there would be a pandemic and what that would look like. And I didn't right. want that. <laughs> and everyone is so, it's just like part of the toddler. Like it needs you so much. You know, and everyone who's involved needs you and is coming to you and you just feel like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> where, yeah. who am I anymore? I'm only in the studio. 
And so finally now it's been just over three years and I feel like, you know, it's walking, it's talking, you know, it still needs me, but I feel like it can play by itself for a while, you know, it can go to grandma's for like a month or, you know, a couple of weeks. Maybe a month. You're right, can tell you if Clearly, it's a never snack or to use the potty, like <laughs> yeah, you don't yeah. have to constantly be keeping track of everything because they'll yeah. let you know. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, it is, I mean, I'm sure in a very similar realization, yeah. where like all of those times you look at your three-year-old and you're like, it was just yesterday. I, you were, you were still in my stump, in my belly, you know, and, and oh I God. feel that way with studio. And I feel, you know, the fact that my mindset has changed to actually really thinking about another, another five years after, you know, the, these five years are up and it's kind of, and that not causing a ton of anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's like, wow, that was the sort of like, how, how did I get here? You know, where I would be on my way to being a New York City business owner for over five years, you know, looking at potentially 10 years of this kind of studio ownership role is sort of um, not, it's definitely not what I planned. <laughs> Which I love. This is some a theme that just keeps coming up. Um I mean, this is not a new idea. I'm not about to say something revolutionary, but it's it's been like popping up very specifically. Mm. Um, recently, I've been seeing it myself in clients, other people, friends, um, that like life doesn't go according to plan. And that's okay. That's like the part, like it's okay. And actually it turns out better. So I would really love because you have such a I find like um I was gonna say unique but it it's unique to me it's different than my upbringing but like I just mm. think such a your your evolution has been so spectacular that <laughs> so like what was the plan like here you are now like where were you Right. Um, yeah, you know, and that the sort of, it is the funny thing because I grew, I grew up pretty, uh, in a, in a somewhat unstable environment. I grew up with a single mom, you know, we didn't have a lot of money and we didn't have, we had some support, but not a lot of support. And so I definitely feel like I evolved to need a plan and want a plan and make a plan because that was the way I could find some little bit of control within, okay. you know, Oh my gosh. Security in an insecure space. And my mother, I mean, my mother did amazing. Absolutely. Of course, you know, but it's just no matter how well, I guess that's just an unstable place as a child. And, um, you know, anytime you're dealing with poverty, right, that is all that tons of insecurity. And really, you know, we sort of talked about this briefly, but we, the most security we found was through religion, through the Christian church. And they were the ones who really took my mom in and provided resources and, and, and didn't look at us differently and really kind of showed unconditional love. Um, it seemed unconditional. <laughs> right. Actually, I no, and it's in, in those, I mean, you know, I love anything culty. And <laughs> I actually just finished reading um, Amanda Montel's book, Cultish, which is mm -hmm. not like something somewhat culty. It's cultish, like the language and about how those communities, like how it, like riding yeah. that line and how it's really built on the community and like a shared language, these shared beliefs that Which give you that st thing. stability and belonging and community yeah. and yeah. support that we all need. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I really think all of these super culty things, like when they first got started, I mean, maybe not all of them, but like, there's always good intentions and there are good people and then it goes awry. Right. I think the danger really is when it has to be exclusive, right? This sort of sense of this is a community you you can belong in, but if you belong here, you can't belong anywhere else. Yeah. The us like, versus them. To be That's what only... makes it culty. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think that is actually when it becomes dangerous. I don't think necessarily the beliefs themselves 
Um, mm -hmm. From my personal experience, I mean, I wasn't in a very extremist uh, group, but, you know, we were in a, you know, it was evangelical, right? So that their whole mission is to evangelize, is to bring other believers to you. And so from that, to make the community bigger, stronger, more successful, right? Um, is the larger kind of maybe less emotionally driven piece. The emotional driven piece is if you truly believe there's a heaven and hell, you don't want your friends and family to go to hell. So you're going to yeah. try and get them <laughs> to believe what you believe so they're in heaven with you. Um, so, I, you, know. you know. So, you know, <laughs> I'm Jewish and this is making me laugh because I have a friend, a friend in high school who's Catholic and she used to say to me like, oh, come on, Alyssa, be a good Catholic. And I would be like, why? Like also <laughs> like according to your beliefs, I'm going to hell anyway. Like, right. Why? Exactly. <laughs> well, and I love the Jewish culture and the religion because they're like, you know, if you're not Jewish, we don't really want you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're not going to try and convince you. We're good. To do anything. Just like, you live you and do let you. Live. <laughs> you. Yeah, you do you. Just like let me do me. If you want to marry into this. That's fine, you know. Also, but, like, well, why do you want to marry into this? Because everybody hates us. Like, everybody <laughs> wants to kill us. We get it. Just like, don't uh, hurt us. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so funny. Uh, okay, so was, you grew it, up. It was not yeah. like it was evangelical, but it was still like. Yeah, it was. Um. You know, we could still, we were in the, in what would they call, you know, the world, right? Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> they were the, that was so just, that is a term. Okay. And yeah, yeah. It's like be in the world, but not of the world is a very, um, you know, common message, right? That we're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be different. And, you know, when you, when you truly know God, you are different. And how could you go back to being this person or the, the, the former self? Right. Yeah. Which is, I think that's actually the fact that I said that. I mean, that is the key. That was such a, that, that is the hardest part to deal with this sense of identity, right. With mm -hmm. this, of like when you are in this world and you profess this belief and you want to be a part of this community, you are no longer like these other people and you are a very different person and there's no going back. <laughs> and so fast forward to New York city in my twenties, you know, I was still like very much holding on to that identity. I was still going to a church here in the city. I was still saving myself for marriage. Like I was still there. And I was someone, I think everyone takes it at a different level. I took it very literally and I was all in. And I think part of that was because it was something I could hold on to in a very stability upbringing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then I yeah. finally started, you know, I think maybe through living in New York and seeing so many different people and meeting so many different being a part of so many different communities, being in the theater community for as long as I was. Um, and also just realizing, you know, I didn't have a lot of support when I moved to New York. I mean, I had support, but not a lot of financial support. It was kind of like, you're welcome to do that, but we really can't help you. So, yeah. you know, make it work. And I think through those three years of, of realizing that I could do this on my own, um, and that I was doing it on my own. It's still, you know, you're always, you're never doing anything on your own. But like, for the most part, really, um, I started thinking for myself in a new way and started realizing, like, I'm the one living my life. So these choices that I'm making are only affecting me. And so why am I spending all of my energy trying to live a life that other people want me to live? And that was kind of the beginning of this sort of separating this new self, right? This new self from, you know, this other person that maybe I thought was still there that I wanted to come back to. And that I, I felt like, you know, I didn't have to be necessarily removed from the world. Like maybe I, the world was a place I wanted to be a part of. Yeah. Not just in, but a part of. Yeah. Part yeah. of that world. <laughs> What would I give if I could live? That no, but like seriously. That's actually you think about those lyrics. I was just thinking about that. So fast. Out of these like, waters, what would I pay to spend a day warm on the sand? This, I mean, Ariel was my favorite princess. Of course, she was. Up. Betcha on land, they understand, but they don't <laughs> reprimand their daughters. Their daughters, yes, 
Yes. Bright young women, sick of swimming, ready to stand. Did oh you know gosh. that that was a feminist manifesto? Because I didn't. I just learned that Not right now. Not literally just now. And then losing her voice. I mean, that was always a big thing for me. You know, of like, well, if you do this, you're going to lose your, the one, we're going to take the one thing you, that actually gives you power. Right. So then even if you are on here, it still wouldn't matter because you have no voice, you have no power. Isn't that crazy? Oh my God. <laughs> and Earth is like totally the devil. You know what I mean? It's like. Oh my or, God. But, yeah, yeah. Cause she sold her devil. voice to the devil. Yeah. But then also that, that devil in that one was a woman, an older woman, you know, which is really interesting. Like what is, this older woman, this other generation doing to their daughters, right? To these young, I don't know. But we could unpack this all day, but. <laughs> oh my God. There's something there. That's big. I can't wait to go rewatch that. Everybody, you know, yeah. you listening, that's our homework. Well, and also, I mean, that stems from a darker, I think it's a grim fairy tale. It's another, there's a darker folk tale that it's actually inspired and like kind of sugar-coated and watered down that just and I haven't read it but it's I think it does not end well you know and there's actually have you ever heard of um women who run with the wolves I, I have the book I I started it yeah. and then I think I started it when it's I a was lot. early not so early postpartum but like early enough that like there was like a break and so I started reading it but then like I don't know, Everett's brain exploded and then I didn't have time to read a book and I forgot to pick it up yeah. again, but I have it. Yeah. It's she basically, I'm trying to look up the author's name. I could say her name, but um, she picked apart all of these old myths and folk tales and stories from our culture that are around the, the consequences of a woman trying to leave society Right. And trying to find her voice, trying to overcome all of the oppression in her community. And it's through every stage of a woman's life. Uh, even like there's ones that deal with her trying to separate herself from her mother, you know, and then, of course, like tons of I mean, it's that like really I cannot, Ariel's like in this it has to be, you know, <laughs> I cannot believe that this book is in my home and I'm not currently reading it. So I'm going to get on. Yeah. That. Yeah. Get on. That. Absolutely. Um. So, as you started a, to... Oh, the author is Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Okay, I'll include the link in the show notes, too. Um, so, I, and I have to say, and I'm sure other people also, but, like, I very much relate to that. Like, sort of, if this, then what? Like, yeah. if... So, wait, like, I do have some questions. And wait, this is my life. Like I'm the one that at night is in bed with my thoughts and I close my eyes and go to sleep and I wake up with them. Like this is mine. What do yeah. I want? And if I get to decide what I want in this one space, can I do that other places too? Mm -hmm. Like how does this, what does that look like? And that can feel all of the feelings like that can be outrageously overwhelming and terrifying it can also be endlessly exciting and exhilarating I mean the potential is infinite yeah. how was yeah. that for you I mean it was terrifying because you know I had really latched on to that identity and it being a source of strength and it being yeah you know this this word unique right there was something about that too that it set me apart in a way that felt good sometimes you know I was different and and so I kind of stood out and I, and people noticed me right and that kind of you know I never met my biological father in this sort of sense of like being seen um yeah. but it was like in a false way I wasn't really being seen for who I was I was being seen for this sort of avant-garde different on the fringe sort of lifestyle um you know of like but then, you know, what that's inter what it was interesting was that I felt like I wasn't being honest with myself in either arena because I was still in the theater community. I was still going out. I was drinking. I was getting drunk. I was, you know, um, like just kind of I was seeing and creating content that didn't align with the sort of Christian values. Right. And so really, I was kind of 
teasing everything out and what felt like the one thing that was still very black and white was the sex piece of like staying a virgin. Like it's very clear when you're not a virgin, like you either have had sex or you haven't. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know. That's like, I remember, I forget when it came up, but I remember having a conversation like that about pregnancy. Like you're not like a little bit pregnant, like you're right. pregnant or not pregnant. Like, right. There, um, yeah. you're, you've had sex You've had yeah. a penis There's in no your going vagina. Back. <laughs> Speaking of like heteronormative, penetrative, right. sexual intercourse, because yeah. sex can be yeah. a lot of things. But like, yeah, like you've either right. done that or you have not. And and the thing is, I hadn't even been naked with another person, so I truly did not have any kind or any form of sex, not even just intercourse. Speaking, I was just, I had never had a sexual experience with another person. Um, so I really was. So you, the most but you did masturbate because you, you specifically said with another person. Okay. Was yes, that? I, I did. Uh, was that was, yeah, that was hard. I had a lot of guilt about that from a young age because yeah. I started at a young age, just intrinsically, organically, um, and I inherently felt like I knew it wasn't approved of, you know, in in yeah. the community that I was raised in, and I think part of it was, you know, we weren't allowed to watch sex scenes, right, and yeah. like cover your eyes and oh, don't look, and oh, that's only for a man and wife, and and so this, there was, but there was no room for it being a part. Like there was no talk about masturbation. Like I didn't even know it was a thing. And I knew we couldn't touch private parts, right, of other people. And, um, and so I thought maybe me touching my own private parts was wrong. And why would I want to do that? And, um, and why is this so good? And this kind of inability to stop, especially at, during those puberty years, you know. Yeah. And I just kind of didn't talk about it and just ignored it, tried to ignore it. And I still did it, but it was just constant. It felt like it was, you know, like I, I felt so much shame after every, every time. And so finally, I think it took me through college and on the other end of college, you know, reading more about getting, starting to get into health and wellness at that point um, and starting to read material where it, it felt like masturbation was, clearly like something that was healthy and was uh, for everybody, not just men. That was the thing too. Like I felt yeah. like I was weird in being a woman that wanted to masturbate uh, because it didn't, uh, my friends weren't really talking about it. <laughs> the, like that didn't yeah. think they were doing it because they never talked about it. And, uh, but I finally, I just kind of came to peace with that for myself and felt like, you know, the church, didn't really have a my church didn't have a very clear view on it or you know a stance on it it was most so I figured okay maybe this is safe and maybe this is okay but maybe I should still like temper it because what if I get too used to it myself and I don't like what the man does when I finally start to have sex and if I get too used to this then I'm not going to be a good partner you know um so there was still a lot of like there was it was still complicated you know there was restriction and still, there's something, that I just put on myself, you know. Right? No, you did. You didn't create it yourself. That was it. It was. It was right. Built it was by Absolutely. all of this messaging, explicit right. and implicit. You know, all of that. And and um, I I don't. I mean, I think we all kind of get. We all get that to some degree. I mean, yeah, and, and there's more. There was more explicit messaging around like if you're in a more religious setting there is more explicit messaging around that but there's something that you said that I just um I think is also important when we're when we're talking about like a woman's sexuality and and exploring it sharing it and you know our goal would be here now like is to own that and have it be ours that we're in charge of and you said something about like a concern being that if you did this too much and got too used to it, you wouldn't like what the man did. And this was something, mm-hmm. the reason it also stuck out to me is because I feel like that's how I was also when I started having physical relationships was just sort of like, I don't know, you do it. You're supposed mm-hmm. to know. Mm-hmm. I'm not supposed to like come here with like, so I like it like this. I like it like that. And then share that with a partner as a way to build emotional intimacy and then also explore other things, but also mm-hmm. have the permission, 
the empowerment, the embodiment yeah. to say, oh, you know what? I actually prefer this or, or, and I don't like that. Try this instead. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. yeah. How many times have, I don't, I'm not going to say you've had this personally, but we've heard this of a friend. We've seen this, that a woman has had a sexual experience with a partner, right? Like going into it where it has not felt good, yeah. but, but she didn't say anything because we're not supposed to. Right. Well, and even just, we don't know. I mean, this was like, I mean, so when I did the start, start, I decided to start having sex, uh, <laughs> uh I had no expectations and I didn't, I, it, it, it's like, we kind of go into it almost assuming for the woman in our society that it's not going to feel good every time. And that is a terrible lie that we've been told and a belief that we've been conditioned to believe for to, a man's sake. Yeah. And, to tolerate you know, that being yeah, the case. Yeah. Right. Or that really the only way, you know, it feels good is through masturbation and through this literal stimulation, which for some women is the, is maybe the way, the best and most effective way for them to have an orgasm. And also just taking orgasm off the table, right? Because I know that there's a lot of women who are struggling and, and or not even struggling, but just that's not their experience uh, of sex. That, that is not, still, that is right, they, one part of pleasure. Exactly. That's exactly. not all of pleasure. Exactly. And so this idea of pleasure and this idea of orgasm and all of that, that was really, you know, I, I didn't even know. I, I went into it without any expectations, which in some way was good because I was already just going to be overwhelmed by the whole experience. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I just want to have, I just want to get it in my body and do the motions and have I, the <laughs> first person I decided to have sex with. I was someone I'm like, I made sure I did not like but that I was attracted to and felt safe with, but I was like, I don't want to ever date this person. I don't want a relationship <laughs> with this person. I don't care if I ever see this person again. And I want it that way because I know <laughs> this experience is going to be so awkward. And um, I literally screamed when I saw his penis. <laughs> yeah. I, can't, I kept closing my eyes and he said, why are you closing your eyes? You can't look at me. I'm like, no, I don't want to see it. <laughs> and he's like, look at my penis and I open my eyes and I scream. That was my. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's so, it's so um, just like <laughs> natural and honest. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't care about this guy. So it, in a way it was the sort of, I, it was the only way I could give myself permission to be completely honest and authentic in that experience Yeah, and didn't have expectations for it necessarily feeling good. But I also, if it didn't feel great, I like communicated that, but I didn't know how it was supposed to feel or supposed to, you know, it, I, yeah. it's just kind of like, okay, this is just what this experience is going to be. And, you know, and so it kind of, that was sort of how I started through that journey and, you know, I didn't really, and then eventually once I had enough sexual partners after that, I'm like, okay, well, I still haven't had an orgasm with a partner. And maybe that's something that maybe that is something I want. And I should start to figure out like, what is like, what do I need to do to get there? You know? Yeah. What, uh -huh. yeah. What yeah. needs to happen before any sort of penetration? Yeah. What needs to happen during any sort of yeah. penetration? And also something you know, another thing I certainly was taught and I just, based on the times I've shared things like, and been like, I don't know, is that just me? It turns out it's not just me. Um, <laughs> that once the man orgasms, it's over. Right. So I was yeah. going to say what you need before penetration, during penetration, or after penetration, if yeah. you want it to be over and you're like, yeah, I'm not going to reach an orgasm today and I just had a really great time together and like, yeah. I'm good. Great. If you're right. like, hey, yeah. so like, I'm still, I here. still, I'm still <laughs> in it. You know, you can yeah. keep going and utilize other ways of exactly. reaching an orgasm with your partner. In other ways. So like, just like, the, this is the PSA that like, the it's over when you both mutually are 
finished, that which does right. can yeah. or can't can like doesn't have to mean an orgasm, but it also can mean. Yeah. Yeah. For both people. If yeah. they want it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh I love this conversation because, you know, from spending so much of my life not talking about sex and then finally going through this transformation where now that's like, I love talking about it because I also, when I was ready for that, I found that still so few people were ready and willing to talk about it or even willing to hold space for someone like me at the time that felt really inexperienced and didn't even know some of this terminology. And, you know, I didn't really watch porn. Like I really was kind of just, and I, I think there were other sub- subconscious reasons for the fact that I think abstinence at the time benefited me for a lot of the emotional stuff that I grew up with well, around yeah. men and things like that. There was something. So I wasn't even it wasn't like I was tempted all the time. And, you know, it was like, actually, you know, I am going to use this as a way to really not mess with that right now. Again, um, the instability was yeah. really um you could find other ways also to heal and explore yeah. healing that within a structure. A structure is going to give you Absolutely. that sense of safety to then be able to, if you then had had more unstable relationships and instability in your lives, I mean, in your life, I imagine yeah. that would have showed up sh- like that. Everything would have looked very different. Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah, so I that, had this really solid framework to ha- kind of hold me within this very unstable environment, but then it was so solid. It was really hard to break out of it um, without, for me, it felt like I had to dismantle it completely in order to get out. And I don't think that that's the case for everyone. I think some people are able to occupy both spaces. Yeah. Um, but I think since my, that space I was in was so absolute, was so black and white, it was hard for me to just automatically be like, oh yeah, there's gray area and I can be in the gray area. Like I had to go, I was in the black, black, black. I had to go all the way to the white, <laughs> right? I yeah. had to like just no black, all white, <laughs> that yeah. was, you know. And, and now we're living in the gray. <laughs> now we're getting back to the gray uh, where it's like, I can see how, you know, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I accept it as all of me as part of that experience. And it's still a part of me. Um, and, you know, it's something that I can still see value in. I love that. Uh, and, but I wish that there was more conversation when I was coming out of it where there was kind of a, an openness to that inexperience because that I, I also found and I'm still finding that on this other space, even if you're not in a chosen community with rules and uh, guidelines, people will not shy away from telling you how to live your life still. <laughs> like. Well, women especially tell me what to do with my about my birth control tell me what to do about my my potential choice of birthing which I'm sure like you experience that and you know telling me what to do about sex and it's like again hello I am the one in this body living this life having this experience not I you know, right and what we want to do and what we would benefit from is sharing of experiences rather than yeah here's what you do. And you can even, it's just, it's even the way it's framed. Like, I, I mean, I believe people have good intentions. Yeah, um, of course. I mean, for the most yeah. part. And, uh, <laughs> but that being like, what worked for me was this, yeah. and this is how I thought about it versus here's what you need to do. Right. You know? Um, and so what I would also love to hear just a little bit about is like how this evolution in your body in yourself because like as a result of your journey in terms of how like sex and sexual intercourse how that has changed your life like outside the bedroom like what Mm -hmm. has that done for you in the way that you show up in the other facets of your life because I think there's a really you know when you're liberated in your body you're liberated in your body absolutely Absolutely. And I mean, as Pilates instructors, we know that the body can be a portal through so many other things, like a way to access something that's stuck that then that can move through in ways beyond our physical body. Um, And Pilates was definitely that way for me as sort of the beginning of that journey was because I was so closed off to my body in a sexual way. I was just closed off to my body altogether. Like I could not feel my hips. I could not like isolate any sort of movement 
And so Pilates was jarring at the time because I'm like, I don't know how to do what you're asking me to do. But through patience and practice, I started to become more in tune and in touch. And I think actually that was sort of what was even the work that led me to being in touch with the fact that I wasn't satisfied in the, in the choices I was making. And so it's kind of this beautiful cycle. And so then through that, through taking that next stage of liberating my body in a sexual way and in a spiritual way and an emotional way, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that all of, of that same year, that 2018 year, I felt inspired to open a studio, you know, and, and this kind of take, taking ownership because the, the whole impetus to that was, you know, I've always had an entrepreneurial drive and spirit. And I was already thinking in that way of like, okay, I'm paying this much in rent for like rental fees. What if I just rented my own space and put my own equipment in there? Like I could probably leverage that and, and be a little bit free from that and have a little bit more money. And then a month later, the studio I was running at closed, you know, uh, it was fast closed. And so it's like, okay, well, maybe this is the time. And it was a sort of sense of that in closing the studio, it sort of took away a lot of the autonomy I had built through yeah. having my own private practice. And there weren't a lot of other options. And I just felt like, well, I'm not going back. So I'm just going to make my own way. And I think that that boldness has always been in me, but I think it was definitely just easier to move forward in action with that idea because I was already kind of in that space of like, well, this is uncharted territory and I'm just going to, everything's uncharted territory. So what's the difference? So that, That's what it felt yeah, like it's like, that actually, this lines yeah. up with everything. This is perfect yeah. because my whole life is uncharted territory and I... Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. And I, I mean, as a woman, as your friend, as mm -hmm. someone who loves you and has known you a long time, I like, I applaud you. <laughs> like that's courageous yeah. Yeah. as fuck. Like that is, that yeah. takes such courage. And I, I specifically using courage because you know, sometimes we say like fearlessness and it's like, I don't really know that that's true because like you do it full of fear with the fear in spite of the fear, which is courage and, and bravery, right. Is like alongside yeah. that. And you did that in every facet of your life. And it's, it's yeah. remarkable and it's inspiring. And I think it's also really awesome that like, even just yesterday you had this moment of like, Look at where yeah. I am. Yeah. Yeah. And that is still parallel with my, you know, personal life in the sense that I found myself through a lot of tumultuous change and a lot of, you know, still sexual exploration through a relationship and then through the end of a relationship and through poly, like exploring polyamorous relationships and in a sexual way. And, to find, and now to be on this new space where I am in a committed loving and like really amazing sexually <laughs> satisfying <laughs> relationship like something I didn't again these absolutes like for a while I felt like well you know I just I thought I had a compromise you know I'm like I don't think I can be have really great sex with someone I really really like and and love and be in a committed healthy relationship and still have really really good sex you know I feel like I have to pick one or the other and same girl you know same yeah yeah. And then you realize that also when you meet someone that you really, really do connect with. Yeah. That's part, that's part of, not the only thing, right. part of what makes the sex so great. Absolutely. And the communication, right? It's, which is oh, key for a relationship and it's key for, for the sex. trust, the yeah. consent. The, yeah. <laughs> the emotional intimacy. That's I sexy, mean, sexy guys, consent. this is the sexiest stuff. <laughs> yes. And so it's like that, me taking those, you know, having those thoughts of like, wow, like how, how did I get here? You know, in, in the, in the very, like the biggest, fullest, most holistic way of realizing like, you know, it's, yeah. And it's my relationship with my business, with even just, how I am in New York City, you know, like moving here, wanting to be an actress on Broadway and 
ended up working as a puppeteer for six years, very successfully. So then not doing much theater at all for the last two years. So then still though, loving this city and feeling like I am still where I should be and still loving it more than I even could dream of, you know, and you just, <laughs> you look at it, you know, I think that that's, I think it's, I think it's a good sign when you realize like, wow, I didn't really plan any of this. I think that that means you were actually on the right path. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me and listening to the end of this episode. Look at you. You're someone who finishes what they start. I love that about you. And if you're picking up what I'm laying down, be sure to visit me over at alyssaalter.com for more resources on how you can alter your life, like downloading the five-minute meditation that I use to start my day with confidence and ease, all before getting out of bed. See you next week.